If you haven't watched part one of this look into Mariko Kawana, make sure to check it out. We go over the little information that's available publicly or at the very least available on non-obscure Japanese websites. Also, it should be mentioned from here on out most of the info, unless explicitly stated, will be from translated websites via Google Translate, YouTube's closed caption translator, and bits and pieces I have hand translated myself. I want to reiterate, I do not speak Japanese, and while I feel most of this information is accurate, I would still take it with a grain of salt. I have reached out to Mariko Kawana, and as of this recording, I still have not received a response. The video itself should wrap up nicely, however, the possibility of filling the gaps at a later date is not off the table, should the opportunity present itself. Regardless, the tale of a former porn star publishing her first novel would encompass almost two decades of her life, with ups and downs, fun tidbits, but also met with a fair share of controversy. Following the exit from the porn industry, Mariko Kwana stayed relatively under the radar for almost a decade. The last notable appearance was at the 20th anniversary celebration of the Japanese magazine publication Video Boy. She attended as master of ceremonies for the event. It is notable as many famous porn stars of the time and future were in attendance, such as Sora Owai. Unfortunately, no footage exists online, at least in the west of this event. Video Boy's original incarnation also shut down in 2007, making a lot of their previous materia hard to find. However, it did have its publication and distribution rights transferred to GOT Corporation. So many adventures. So much to be thankful. There still is a website today, however, it's mostly filled with modern talent and nothing pertaining to Mariko Kawana or any of her previous work. As a side note, I did intend to purchase an issue of Video Boy around that era, either after or running up to the event in an attempt to get pictures or translate any additional information. However, none of the magazine issues available to purchase online are around that time frame, or the time frame that we would need for this situation. From here, Mariko didn't quite fall off the grid. As we previously discussed, her book Sex Evolution was made while she was pregnant with her eldest child. Soon after the book's release, she would give birth and spend a majority of her time focusing on motherhood and raising her child up to 2011. Various Wikipedia pages and obscure Japanese websites state during this time period she worked as a columnist and novelist. However, this conflicts and contradicts other information and sources available. If she was a columnist during this time, it's not mentioned anywhere save for a dead link on Wikipedia, nor is it mentioned on any of Mariko Kawana's social media outlets. The idea of her being a novelist during this time period doesn't add up as well because her first novel, Gibo no Enko, wasn't published until 2011. Which, funny enough, the Wikipedia article about Mariko Kawana herself contains many of these contradictions in the same sections. This, though, I feel adds to the enigmaticness, mystique, and allure of someone like Mariko Kawana because the information's out there somewhere. She has done notable things, yet for some reason the details are convoluted, obscure, or just flat out missing, despite the fact she has a larger than life persona about her. It's almost as if the information is intentionally being taken down, blocked, or made to be hard to find. Considering the fact she would eventually turn into a horror slash mystery writer makes this aspect of her seem rather fitting in a cosmic sense. During this time, Mariko made an appearance at the 4th annual SOD or Soft On Demand Awards with her husband. However, similar to the Video Boy event, footage either doesn't exist or is very rare to come by, tucked away into the fabled lands of Japanese-ran websites. It was only through the Wayback Machine's entry on Mariko Kawana's wiki I was able to find a few images and details of the event. It is an interesting look at the subculture at the time. And without running the risk of going completely off topic, most of the individuals involved in the adult industry seem to have a good sense of humor. They're self-aware, oftentimes poking fun at themselves, but still serious about their work. Combining a passion for the industry, but not forgetting to have fun in the process. At the very least, is the perception taken from the award show. Specifically, this detail revolves around Mariko Kawana herself. As later in the show, it is revealed through the chairman of the SOD that Mariko Kawana would be the face of one of his new business ventures. That being the face on various rice packages in his new company. Company, National Farm. Mmm, so good and tasty. It's unclear how long or if this venture is still in the production, as the company name is so generic that any information is scant at best. Perhaps, though, it is, that is part of the tongue in cheek humor with the Japanese pornography business, as subtle trolling is rampant throughout the industry. Quote Gunari Takahashi If you put it next to the register, you might buy it as an AV. If you are satisfied with your sexual desire, next is your appetite. Although clearly Mr. Takahashi was having a bit of fun, he still believed and showed confidence in himself and the product. Something that would be representative of other members of the porn industry as well as Mariko Kawana over the next decade. Mariko would stay relatively out of the spotlight, save for one interview in the book and, excuse my butchering of the language, Sei Shoku Sha no Habito Ano Sakai no Shigatoshi Tachi, which translates roughly to professionals, workers of the world. 
In it, the series authors interview many major figureheads of the porn industry during this time frame. Mariko and her husband are two of the 17 individuals interviewed for the book. As of now, there doesn't seem to be any translated version or any way to auto-translate. Speaking a bit off the cuff, I ordered this in a few of the other Mariko Kawana books. I don't speak Japanese like I said in the previous video and earlier in the video, but I'm going to attempt to find someone who can assist with translations once I receive the books and have the time to do so. From here, Mariko would remain dormant and out of the spotlight. Speaking from experience, it can be hard leaving a career behind. When you spend so much time in an industry or profession, it can be difficult to walk away as much of the world has changed. The best way to describe it would be when you're on a train speeding down the tracks. It may be rocky and wild, throwing you every way possible and occasionally making you sick to your stomach. Now imagine suddenly jumping off that train. Some might be wounded while others get away without a scratch. Yet this train is still barreling forward, and you're not on it. You try to readjust your senses from that crazy ride, your body pulsates all over. Then the quiet sets in. You are no longer a part of that train. Sure, you can find a job working in the railroad construction or other industries pertaining to that train, yet that train is long gone in a different direction, while you must set out on a different path. Sometimes you stay in one place for an extended period, and oftentimes pure chance or maybe fate is what drives you to strike out in a direction. For Mariko Kawana, that would come a mere five years later, when her reemergence and popularity would come from an unlikely source. North Korea has always been a point of controversy, since the split between the North and South during the Korean Wars in the 50s. After the split, the North took a more communistic and authoritarian approach to governing its people. The people have since lived under the tyrannical leadership of the Kim family. This is an oversimplification of North Korea and its controversies in politics, governing people, and nation overall. However, it is necessary to paint at least a basic picture of North Korea and the lack of freedoms that exist within its nation's borders. The spread of information is almost entirely illegal, save for what the North Korean government puts out. There is no freedom of speech or expression. Again, an oversimplification, but with that being said, it's not an understatement to say that Mariko Kawana being the most famous porn star in North Korea in 2010 is a big deal. In 2010, the Tokyo Reporter wrote an interesting article regarding this topic. This article and others like it referenced are all in the description to read just for your information. In it though, they go over the intricacies of how a nation shut off from the rest of the world could even obtain pornographic material. It isn't by the most legal means, and despite North Korea's strict attempt to silence any Western influence on its culture, many of its citizens end up receiving pornographic and or explicit material through the grapevine. After it is smuggled in through the country, of course. Upon learning that she was famous in North Korea six years after her retirement, Mariko could only respond with, it should be stated that North Korea does not have access to many amenities the West has, so Mariko's rise in popularity could have stemmed from a lack of diverse selection in their pornographic consumption. However, it shouldn't take away from the accomplishment, as even the simple fact of owning a pornographic disc or any hardcore slash explicit material can lead to hard labor for two years and potentially push to four. Mariko Kawana has the distinction of being so sought after in a country you risk imprisonment and forced labor just to watch her have sex. There's some good in this world, Mr. Pearl, and it's worth fighting. It's unclear if this was the spark that reignited Mariko's interest in returning to the entertainment world, but in 2011 she would debut her first novel, Gibo no Enko. She would continue to work on various erotica novels throughout the 2010s all the way to 2015. Some notable examples would be her work in the Futaba collection. Some of these Bunko novels fetch a pretty hefty price on Amazon and currently have not had digital editions for purchase. It is a shame, as much of Mariko Kawana's work is limited to physical releases only. However, from a business approach it makes sense, as it adds scarcity to her work as an author. In the process of writing these erotica novels, Mariko would also begin work on what would later be her primary passion, and that is the work on true story horror novels and novellas. With her first notable example being Akai Jikoju Horal. However, before jumping into Mariko Kawana's extensive and unfortunately non-dated convoluted horror catalog, there was a notable event that took place in 2016, where Mariko would find herself amid controversy as she faced organizations such as Lighthouse Center for Human Trafficking, Human Rights Now, the HRN, and People Against Pornography and Sexual Violence, PAPS. We briefly mentioned in the previous episode of Mariko Kawana that porn or sex in general is still seen as a taboo topic of discussion in many Japanese households. However, despite this, the Japanese pornography business is a multi-billion dollar industry. Hentai clearly exists. General, you have my curiosity. Now you have my attention. 
Over the years, various Japanese AV actresses have stepped forward to state they were conned into becoming porn stars, oftentimes being loaned money to have a debt to be paid on later, or sometimes just being forced to commit the acts by the people at the shoots. In a study conducted by HRN, many companies will often employ very vaguely worded contracts in order to keep the women silent and continue to be forced into the pornographic films. In 2016 alone, Lighthouse reported that at least 60 actresses in the porn industry had reached out for help in escaping the porn industry. There probably are contracts floating around on the surface and deep web, however, at the time of this recording, I was unable to locate any. The implication from both the Lighthouse organization and HRN are both disturbing and unsettling to say the least. Both organizations called for a labor movement for the industry itself in order to combat the human trafficking epidemic in the Japanese pornography business. Mariko Kawana, however, had a different take. Mariko recounted during her tenure in the pornography business that she never faced the pressures that many porn stars made in accusations to. Quote Mariko Kawana, Porn actresses come to act, not have sex. Neither I nor anyone around me has ever experienced the kinds of things depicted in the HRN report. Maybe it's because I'm a strong woman and strong people tend to draw other strong people. Her comments were met with serious criticism from the various agencies, specifically the Japan Times commented that her comments would lead many actresses into believing labor rights would rob them of their liberties. Mariko had stated that in their current form, porn actresses were private contractors able to speak up and refuse work if doing so. Mariko quoted, If porn actresses are employed with labor contracts, they will enter into highly exploitable relationships, vulnerable to all manner of harassment from their employers, long work hours, and lower take-home pay. The Japan Times responded by saying, Why is a porn heavyweight like Kawana spending precious waking hours at the keyboard blasting away at labor law? Because although she was an actress, today she is management. Despite the harsh criticisms from her peers and other organizations, Mariko Kawana still felt that there were many problems to be solved, from the human trafficking to making sure that actresses still receive fair treatment and compensation. Knowing this, she started her own foundation, Protection for Actresses' Rights, and similarly to the other organizations to call upon the porn industry to have standardized and transparent contracts with the various organizations. Ones that would still allow the actresses to work and receive the same compensation, but also transparent to avoid the tricks of getting gullible people stuck in the business and she was right you know in my previous video at the very beginning i talked a lot about like only fans porn hub and these very like they're not decentralized platforms but you can basically come and go as you please and make whatever content you want to when you want to and you'll get paid according to how many views you get or how much your different fan base will pay you based you know on only fans or things like that so I think what Mariko Kawana's idea was, or at least where her heart was at in this entire um, labor rights activism, was that she genuinely wanted to have um, these open contracts where you would have transparency, where it would eliminate the need for tricking women into joining the porn industry. Um, if you look at a lot of like the Lighthouse and the different organizations statements, they made it seem like the Japanese porn industry was more of like a sex workshop rather than like films that they were creating. Um, now that's not to say that Marika Kawana doesn't deserve some bit of criticism as well too. Uh, there's definitely an argument that could be made that, you know, maybe she was doing this just for attention or even for um, like the promotion of like a book. Which doesn't really, to me, seem like the case. She doesn't seem like that type of person. Um, especially when it comes to like her different passions. It feels like whenever she's passionate about something, she genuinely like goes all in on it. As you'll see in a little bit when I talk about her horror novels. But one thing that continuously popped up, um, and it really became apparent when I got into this particular topic, um, was that... Even in the first video, a lot of Mariko Kawana's information just kind of seemed to be gone. Um, especially when the, the one news organization stated that why is a heavy hitter in the porn industry spending countless hours, you know, on Twitter talking about human rights and activism. And that made me think, okay, if she's such a heavy hitter, why is there like so little information out there on her like and I'm, i mean i'm even talking like a lot of the obscure japanese websites like i've had to go through and translate a lot of like a lot of different japanese websites to find like even like scant amounts of information about her past even like her in the porn industry um and i kept getting this feeling that like a lot of the information was just gone uh, either it was buried or taken away or something 
Now, I can't prove any of that, um, especially um, seeing as how I haven't been able to make correspondence with Mariko Kawana herself, but I don't know, it was just this weird feeling that I had, like, doing research that a lot of it was just gone. So, and I'm not going to sit here pretend like I'm an expert on, you know, various labor laws or activists and, you know, different things like that, but... What I can say is, at the end of the day, considering that we have these different organizations like Pornhub and OnlyFans that are essentially kind of in a way making the porn industry, like, at least in terms of, like, the old way of things, completely obsolete. So, at the end of the day, she was kind of right. Around 2015, Mariko Kawana began writing horror bunko book novels that she still does to this day. She also became a member of the Mystery Writers of Japan organization, which are a group of people who all write mystery or horror novels. Mariko has written and contributed to many horror books since stepping into this particular field. Most of her horror novels all carry the true stories quote unquote tagline with her books, as most of these books are written in a shorter format, often acting as a smaller short stories amidst these books. What I find the most fascinating about her time as an author is that I genuinely cannot tell if she is playing a character or if she is genuinely writing quote unquote true horror stories. Why this matters is in interviews she talks about going and meeting with various people and that the stories she writes are based on her experiences or the experiences of people who have told her these stories. Even on her various social media outlets, there are distinct almost wanted type posts that state if you have a story to tell to contact her. I'm not sure if this is just a translation error on my part or if she really is interviewing all these people for her books. Either way, it is very entertaining as there are multiple videos out there of her in her dark kimono speaking about interviewing people and talking about the ghost stories. The gimmick adds to the mystique and allure of someone like her. To say Mariko is invested in this community would be an understatement. She actively promotes her books and colleagues' horror books on Twitter and other social media outlets. At the time of writing this, she is even set to appear on a Fuji TV show dedicated to telling ghost stories. As an avid horror fan myself, it's always fun to find a new movie, show, or author I was not previously aware of. Unfortunately, much like her erotica novels, there are no ebooks or translations available. However, not all is lost. I have linked below a few YouTube videos from other channels where she reads excerpts from her various books. It is in Japanese, however, if you change the language to auto translate, you will be able to read the short stories. Keep in mind, however, the Google Translate is very terrible, <laughs> but it is better than nothing and you will be able to at least understand the story she was writing. Mariko Kawana may have also starred in, wrote, or directed a movie called The Concentrator, as on her various social media outlets, it is one of the pictures in her horror collage. However, the DVD is out of print and no one's selling it literally anywhere. Much like so many other pieces of Mariko Kawana, the mystery continues. Despite only writing horror horror novels for the past five years, Mariko Kwan has written well over 30 books, or has at least written the stories of people who have claimed to have paranormal activities. At this stage in her life, she seems to be very much active in the occult slash ghost story community of Japan, something worth looking into at a later date. In terms of pricing, all of her books are genuinely fall in the $20 range, however, a couple notable exceptions can be rather expensive. I have ordered a few in an attempt to translate as well someday. One of the unfortunate things with Mariko Kawana's horror book selection is that a lot of the dates seem to be missing from when they were initially published. The main reason that I say this is when you look up many of the ISBNs for the various horror novels, a lot of them will say 2019, and unless all of them came out last year, it would seem that Amazon and various other websites don't have the exact publishing date which is a little bit disheartening. However, it's not impossible to date these various books. It is just gonna be a bit of a monumental task considering that it's very hard to find date specifics on when these came out. It is something I am gonna do. However, it is gonna take me a little bit of time to do so. So where can Mariko Kawana go from here? It's hard to tell as she has already lived such an enigmatic life. From porn star to horror author, rights activist to wife and mother, Mariko Kawana exemplifies what it truly means to live and experience as much of life as you can. Throw caution to the wind and just go. Whatever avenue she chooses, I guarantee it will continue to have the same rebellious tone she has displayed throughout her life, continuing to buck the trends and strike out whatever path she chooses. In a duel. You know, I gotta do something about you, otherwise I'm not gonna get what I want. Yes, that goes without saying. Great. Hey everybody, just wanted to take a quick second to thank you all for watching the entirety of the video. It means a lot, and hopefully you guys enjoyed it and are enjoying the content I've been putting out the past couple of weeks. 
Um, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Jam and Sam Miller. Um, he's the one who did the amazing Donkey Kong Country 2 uh, disco train restoration that you heard in the background of the video. Um, I had asked him if I could use it in the video and he was kind enough to say yes. So thank you very much, Jam and Sam Miller. Um, if you haven't checked out his channel yet, definitely go do that. He makes some amazing music on his channel. Um, a lot of really great original tracks as well as various restoration tracks. Um, I do have a link of his channel in the description below. Um, so thank you again, Jam and Sam Miller. I genuinely appreciate that. Um, this video was a lot bigger <laughs> than I had anticipated it being. And it is extremely late while I'm recording this right now and finishing up the editing. So I won't dawdle on too long. But I wanted to thank everyone for watching. Genuinely, I appreciate it. Um, all the feedback um, that I've been getting has been very helpful. If you do have any questions or have any comments or anything that you would like for me to do in you know, future videos, definitely let me know. I have a couple other interesting kind of obscure porn star type people that I would like to do videos on. Um, but it's definitely going to, after after this one, it's definitely going to be a couple of weeks. But uh, definitely look forward to those. Well, anyway, thanks for watching, guys. I certainly appreciate it. Make sure to keep things light and rebellious, and I'll see you all in the next one.